This is the first of our lectures that will take us through chapter eight of Dummett and Foot. And at the beginning of this chapter, Dummett and Foot say, all rings in this chapter are commutative. So this is uh, an example where they give an assumption early on at the beginning of a section, and then they don't continue to repeat it everywhere throughout the chapter. So this is something you should be aware of. Please keep this in mind for the next several lectures. Okay, so what is this chapter about? We know fields and we know integral domains. So chapter eight is all about classes of rings that sit in between integral domains. Remember commutative rings with identity that have no zero divisors and fields, which are commuted integral domains in which every non-zero element is a unit. So what are those classes of rings? We have Euclidean domains, which we'll talk about in this lecture and the next one, the subject of section 8.1 of the book. Uh, fields are Euclidean domains. Not every Euclidean domain is a field. Uh, we have principal ideal domains or PIDs. That's the subject of section 8.2 of Dummett and Foot that we'll get to uh, soon. So every we'll see that every Euclidean domain is a PID, but the converse is not true, that there are PIDs that are not Euclidean domains. Then we have unique factorization domains, UFDs, the subject of section 8.3 of Dominant Foot. And every PID is a UFD, but not every UFD is a PID. And then uh, UFDs are integral domains. Not every integral domain is a unique factorization domain. OK, so this first uh, this lecture, this first lecture within chapter eight is going to focus on Euclidean domains. But in order to talk about them, I want to take a step back and talk about some examples that we really know and understand. So to do that, I first want to give a careful definition of a PID. So a principal ideal domain or a PID is an integral domain in which every ideal is principal. OK. So what's an example that we know? Well, Z is a PID. And why is that true? Because what is an ideal? It's an additive subgroup that behaves in a certain way with respect to multiplication. So Z is a PID because an even stronger thing is true. Not only is every ideal in Z principle, but every subgroup, every additive subgroup of Z is cyclic. So what are they? the trivial subgroup, and then nz for all n at least one. So because every one of these subgroups is already cyclic and every ideal is certainly an additive subgroup, that already shows that z is a PID. But how did this argument actually work? Like, What did we do to show that every subgroup of z was cyclic? What was the main thing that made that work? Well, let's prove it again. So. I'll phrase it in terms of ideals, but it's the same argument that goes for subgroups. So let's say that I is an ideal of Z. If I is trivial, then it is the principal ideal generated by zero. So it is principal. So the trivial ideal is principal. So let's take uh, I to be a non-trivial ideal. And the key idea here is sort of two things that are related. We have the division algorithm on Z. So the division algorithm is the main thing that we'll apply to complete this proof. What are we going to apply it to? Well, the idea to show that I is principal is actually to find a generator for it. And what we're gonna do is choose A to be a non-zero element of I for which the absolute value of A is minimal. Okay, if you take the ideal generated by A, certainly that's contained in I. So what we're going to do is show inclusion the other way, that in fact, I is equal to the ideal generated by A. And therefore, I is principal, where what is a generator? Pick any element that is not 0 and has absolute value of A minimal. So we know how absolute values work in Z. If you have a non-zero integer, there are exactly two things, a and negative a, that have the same absolute value. Okay. 
So how are we going to show that inclusion holds the other way? We need to pick an arbitrary element of the ideal and show that it's in the ideal generated by A. So let's say B is in I. And now we'll apply the division algorithm. So what does it tell us? We can write B as some integer Q times A plus R, where R is between 0 and A. So it's 0 is less than or equal to R is less than A. So what good does that do us? Well, if B is an I and A is an I, certainly Q times A is an I. So B minus Q times A is an I, and that is R. But we chose A so that the absolute value of A was minimal among all non-zero elements of the ideal. So what does that mean? Well, if R is not zero, the absolute value of R is less than A. So that means that R has to be zero by the minimality of the absolute value of A. So now what does that mean? That means B is equal to Q times A plus nothing, plus zero. So B is equal to Q times A, which means B is in the ideal generated by A. So in fact, we've seen that every element of I is in the ideal generated by A. So I is the ideal generated by A and I is principal. So it's worth taking a step back and saying, okay, how did this argument work? The division algorithm was certainly a key part of it. And then we also have this nice function on Z, absolute value. And uh, how do we even know that we can choose something in this ideal I with absolute value of A minimal is that this absolute value is giving us a function from the ideal or from Z to the non-negative integers. And uh, there's only finitely many things in Z with absolute value less than a given number. So, you know, you have this ordering of elements on Z given by absolute value. It's not a total ordering, like a number and its negative have the same absolute value, but it allows us to say, well, zero has absolute value zero. Is there something of absolute value one? No, move on. Is there something of absolute value two? No, move on. And eventually you'll hit some element in your ideal that has minimal absolute value. Okay, so I'm gonna pause and erase and talk about another example where a very similar idea, idea shows that a ring is a PID. Let's now give a very similar argument to prove that another ring is a PID. Let's say F is a field, then F bracket X, the polynomial ring uh, with coefficients in F is a PID. The proof will be very, very similar to the one that showed that Z is a PID. Let's say I is an ideal in F bracket X. If it's the trivial ideal, then it is the ideal generated by zero and its principal. So let's suppose that it's not the trivial ideal, ideal. And the key idea here is that one, there is a kind of division algorithm in F bracket X. And two, we can order polynomials by degree. So we'll do something just like what we did for Z and just take F to be a non-zero element of I that has minimal degree. So we can do this because polynomials you know, they each have a degree. Degree gives this map from F bracket X to the non-negative integers, and it orders them. It's not a total ordering. Like there might be very, very many polynomials with the same degree, but you can check, do I have a polynomial of degree one? No. Do I have a polynomial of degree two? No. Do I have a polynomial of degree three? And at some point, you will hit a polynomial that is in your ideal because the degree of any polynomial is finite. Okay, F is some polynomial of minimal degree. doesn't matter which one you pick, just pick one. The ideal generated by F is an I. And we're gonna show inclusion the other way. So what do we have to do? We have to show that any element of I is contained in the ideal generated by F. So let's say G is an I. Now we'll apply this division algorithm in F bracket X. And I will prove this later in this lecture 
But since this is a result, it's probably familiar to many of you when you're thinking about, I don't know, polynomials in Q bracket X or something. I just want to state it and use it now, and then we'll come back and prove it a little later in this lecture. OK, so G is some polynomial in I. F is our polynomial of minimal degree. And the division algorithm statement is that there exist polynomials Q and R in F bracket X with G equal to Q times F plus R, where either R is 0 or the degree of R is between 0 and the strictly less than the degree of F. The degree of R is less than the degree of F. What's the idea here? I mean, we will prove this, but the idea is just polynomial long division. Like, take the biggest multiple of F, uh, yeah, multiply F by some polynomial so that the leading terms of G and F match up. Then you subtract and you do it again. You like figure out what the next term of Q should be and so on. Okay, so what's the idea now is, uh, G is in the ideal, and G is Q times F plus R. Q times F is certainly in the ideal because F is in the ideal, and it's an ideal. So that means that R is equal to Q times F, which is in the ideal, minus G, which is in the ideal. So it's in I. What do we know about R? We know that the degree of R is less than the degree of F. Maybe it's zero. By the minimal, uh, sorry maybe R is actually zero and the degree of R is less than the degree of F. But what do we know about the degree of F? We chose F in I to have minimal degree among all non-zero elements. So either R is zero or the degree of R is less than the degree of F. So by this minimality of the degree of F, R is equal to zero. So what does that mean? R equals Q times F minus G uh, or sorry, G equals Q times F plus R. If R is zero, then G equals Q times F. And this is definitely in the ideal generated by F. So that means anything in I is in the ideal generated by F and I is equal to the ideal generated by F. So what did we see? We saw something actually better than what we stated here. We saw that if you have an ideal I, either it is the trivial ideal or it is principal and it is generated by any elements in the ideal of minimal degree. Okay, so this proof was just like the proof for Z. The one big difference was that degree of F played the role of absolute value of A. So we have this special function that takes something in F bracket X to a positive non-negative integer, something in Z to a non-negative integer. What's going on here? in these two arguments that's so similar is what's really sh happening here, what we're really seeing is both Z and F bracket X are not just principal ideal domains, but they are Euclidean domains. And every Euclidean domain is a principal ideal domain. And the proof is gonna look just like this proof, but we're gonna need to figure out what plays the role of degree of F and absolute value of A. So in the next video, I will give you a real definition for what it means to be a Euclidean domain.